All righty. So to my right is Jeremy Bentham, uh, the Vice President of Global Business Environment and Head of Shell Scenarios at Shell, uh, specializes in uh, forecasting the future. Uh, to his right is um, Matt Rogers, Senior Partner at McKinsey and uh, previously a Senior Advisor to the uh, Secretary of Energy. And then we have Doug Suttles, the CEO of Incana, one of the largest um, shale drillers in North America. Um, so I want to start things out. We have kind of some big news today involving Jeremy's company. Um, we were going to start looking at the future, but let's stay with today for a second. So Shell announced today that you are pulling out of drilling in the Arctic going forward after years of effort, billions of dollars spent, some disappointing results, and you're pulling the plug on that. Why was that part of the Shell scenario for several years, and now it doesn't make sense anymore for the company? Well, I think that um, you know, reassessing the exploration opportunities in uh, that particular part of the world uh, you know, it's still a part of the world which has a lot of prospects. It's a, an important part of the world for developing resources, um, not only for the United States, but globally. And you have to always think about these things in the broader context. But there's also um, what you learn. And by drilling an exploration well, you learn certain things about the geology. And, and that's just kind of part of the business. Uh, if you're an explorer, sometimes you have disappointments, and you know, I have to say, I've got things on social media from people who've been working responsibly in that area for some time, saying that they're gutted. Uh, people in the local economy are disappointed. But you also have uh, upsides. I mean, recently positive news from Gabon, from Malaysia, from Oman, uh, and from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and so these things form part of a diversified portfolio and speak to why you have to think of this particular industry globally, but also over many decades. Okay, speaking of thinking about many decades, uh, let's step back for a minute. Your group at Shell, the Scenarios Group, specializes in looking out into the future, decades in the future, assessing the probabilities of where we're going. Um, in the current environment, oil prices are volatile, uh, renewable technology is advancing, but still a small percentage of the mix. Uh, we have big climate change conference coming up in Paris. All this is going on. Set the stage for us now. Is the path forward hopeful? Well, I think that a one way of describing is that we've entered already an era of volatility and transitions. And if we have multiple outlooks that consider different kinds of political choices, different kinds of technological opportunities. But it's useful sometimes to sit back and look at the whole range of those and say, what are the key lessons that come from that? And if, if we do that, I think we see two features to transition, one of which is quite familiar to those of us who've been in the industry for a number of years, and one of which has got something new to it. So in terms of what's familiar, that's global growth. Uh, all the outlooks, if you look at what is going to be used over the coming decades as more people enjoy the benefits of modern life that the minority have enjoyed for a long time, and that begins to spread towards the majority, the energy required to fuel that is going to be at least twice as much as today's energy over time. And we've seen growth um, over, over the decades. Now, the other aspect is a shift in the mix. Essentially, since you know, the late 60s and 1970s, whilst there's been a doubling of global energy consumption, the mix has been you know, largely static. Um, it's been you know, 80, 85 percent hydrocarbons. But we're now seeing, for technological reasons, cost reasons, uh, for policy reasons, this shift towards progressive decarbonization. And that's a new phenomenon. But that kind of transition, that kind of shift mix, is something that the industry has uh, not only dealt with before, but, but enabled previously. You know, the shift from uh, wood and coal and dung to, to coal, from coal to oil and gas. These kinds of things happen over time. And we see that coming. And in fact, if we look forward, 
we can see what I think is quite an inspiring prospect of a world which can be comfortable for everyone, in which there is the energy to fuel a prosperous, comfortable well-being for people, and with net zero emissions. And I think that that's quite an inspiring prospect, but it's not easy. I mean, clearly, renewables are going to play an important role within that, but they're not a silver bullet. Doug, I want to go to you for a second. Um, you've been right in the mix of you know, what's really been a revolutionary energy story in the last seven years or so, the, the shale revolution. If you go back to 2008, people were worried we were going to have $500 a barrel oil. They were absolutely certain that we were going to be importing natural gas to the United States. We were running out of gas. And you know what's happened since then, we've doubled oil production in the US. Price of natural gas has come down. We have a 100-year supply of gas. Um, incredible uh, technological revolution and, and supply revolution. And, uh, but all that supply now has kind of rocked the market. So we're dealing with some volatility. Uh, you're right in the mix with that. Um, but you told me that you're not really worried about it. At the beginning of the year, you're actually kind of excited about where that's taking the industry, that the industry is continuing to innovate. Because at the beginning of the year, people were saying, boy, the shale drillers are going to get killed. And you're saying, not so fast. Well, yeah, you know, I think the, the one thing people have um, always underestimated is, uh, um, is, is the talent, the innovation, the creativity in this industry. If you study this business, and, and it goes back to the kind of 1860s, there's been peak oil stories written about every decade since then, and that was 150 years ago, and I think they'll keep writing them. And the one thing they miss is they only look at the supply you can see at that moment in time. And for some reason, they believe that the creativity in all these men and women who work in this industry will just stop one day. Um, shale's a great example. We've known that shales have hydrocarbons in them. They're the source rock that supplied this stuff, and we've known that forever, but we didn't believe we could get those hydrocarbons out economically. But one what of what the neat things about the United States in particular in this industry is you have this interesting intersection of private mineral ownership, availability of capital. You actually generally have an industry that's regulated locally. The people that are most impacted make the rules around that. And what happens is you turn that creativity loose and some people went out and spent a lot of money uh, for quite a long period of time until they unlock that trend. But that pattern's been going on for decades. So the latest trend has been oil and gas from shales. And in fact, if you remember, just 10 years ago, we were staying away from oil and shales because we didn't think that would work, but we thought gas would work. Right. And then five years later, we figure out oil will work too. And if you go back before that, it was deep water. And if you go back before that, it was elements of the Arctic and on and on and on. Um, and uh, an individual I know in this industry is fairly widely well thought of. His name's Tom Petrie. He has a saying that oil and gas is not found in the ground, it's found in the minds of men and women. And I don't think that process will stop. Now clearly there is a finite amount, but I don't think we'll actually run out of it. Uh, I think the issue will be other factors will drive a changeover of the energy mix. It actually won't be, we'll run out of supply. A year ago, the price of oil had been high for a few years, around $100 a barrel. It was starting to go down, we were about to have the moment where the Saudis said they would not cut production, that really sent oil tumbling. But people were saying, if oil's not at $75 a barrel or roughly around there, all this fracking you know, in the Western United States is not gonna be economic. Now oil's bouncing around in the 40s and, and you're, not, you're not sweating bullets. So what's, I mean, what kind of innovation has happened? Has that just been, uh, you know, discipline just causes the pace of, of change to increase? Well, you know, in, in our business, um, what's, what's interesting is I can't change the price of the product. The oil I pr my company produces or the natural gas is the same as the oil and the natural gas all of our competitors produce. The only I can, thing I can impact is the cost of bringing that to market. We sell a commodity product, and what we have to do to win, no matter what the price is, is find a way to make a margin. And we actually know that the best tool to do that is innovation. Um, in, in my company, in February of this year, we got the top 40 people together and talked about one thing, which is make sure we don't stop innovating in a downturn, because that will actually unlock our success. And it's interesting, if I just take a couple of the places we operate, out in West Texas, we started the year averaging about 28 days per well to drill a well. 
our latest wells are coming in in 15. Mm. That's in one year. Mm -hmm. And that's in a place the industry has been drilling for 80 years uh, today. And what's happening is some of its step changes in technology because we're a very, we're a very te technologically oriented industry. And one of the examples of this today in our company, we employ drill bit engineers. These are the bits that grind through the rocks. Normally you historically wouldn't do that, but with today's manufacturing capability, we can custom de design a drill bit for every section of each well. You couldn't do that five years ago. You definitely couldn't do it 50. And what that's doing is getting the well shorter. And because our organization knows we have to find a way to make a margin no matter what the price is, we absolutely have to continue to do that. And you've seen that right across our sector. And you know who wins in this process? The consumer. Mm -hmm. The consumer wins because the better we get at what we do, actually the lower the, lower the price of the product we produce sells for and the ultimate winner in that process is the average homeowner or the average consumer of energy, which is everybody. Matt, you have a book which is, which is out uh, in the hallway, Resource Revolution, and it presents all of this roiling change as, uh, you know, you describe it as one of the great business opportunities of all time, really. Trillions of dollars of profits out there for the taking uh, kind of a new industrial revolution. Uh, so give us your perspective on, you know, how to think about this. If you th look at it in a short-term way, energy prices are up and down, you know, how do we know which way to bet, you know, and is this going to drive off investment in renewable energy? But you're talking about new technologies that are going to bring greater efficiency to the process and, and change the, the whole game for us. So how is that going to work? Well, I, I think this is the most interesting time we've had in energy in at least 100 years. Uh, and it is driven by the combination of what's happening with industrial technology and information technology. I mean, what Doug and his team have done are a great example of that. You begin to be able to drill horizontally, and all of a sudden you open up a set of resources that we've all known were there but didn't think were economical. And, and, and that starts opening up a driving down the unit cost and opening up the size of the market quite dramatically over what everybody expected. And what, what's exciting is if you look at, across energy sectors, you see the same story about unit costs coming down. I mean, solar costs are coming down on the order of 20% every year. Energy storage costs are coming down maybe 30% every year, you end up with that kind of rate of innovation and who benefits, the consumer ends up benefiting quite dramatically. And importantly to the conversation, the size of the market ends up going up uh, um, much larger than anybody expected. Everybody keeps saying, what we're trying to do is get a lower unit cost against the existing market. What ends up happening, and you were talking about this earlier, you get a lower unit cost, you get a much larger uh, market. The, one of the earlier panels was talking about Uber and we talk in the book about how transportation is getting changed by, uh, by autonomous and by ride sharing and things like that. In San Francisco right now, two things are happening. One is there are five times more rides than there were in the taxi uh, administration because, in fact, we have a lower unit cost, more widely available, more easily accessible mode of transportation. So we've increased the market by five-fold. That's terrific. The other thing that's fascinating in San Francisco right now is that the price of a parking space in an apartment building, which used to be the premium part of the apartment, is actually going down because the marginal renter doesn't need a parking place. And so what you see is a transformation of different uh, industry sectors because of that rate of innovation. And, and it, again, it creates this tremendous opportunity for growth because the market gets bigger. You're able to serve more and more consumers who weren't in the money, who couldn't afford the energy resources uh, to, to have a middle class life. And around the world, the ability to get access to that is what is in fact creates a huge business opportunity globally. I hope that parking space trend reaches New York soon, because I think we recently <laughs> had the first million dollar parking place in New York. Um, but I guess one of my questions is, um, you know, for instance, you talk about nanotechnology boosting productivity and, uh, and, and batteries and battery efficiency. And batteries, you know, would be a huge game changer if we had better battery technology to store wind and, and you know, solar power. Uh, but is it gonna get here soon enough for us to meet the demands that we have as, as you know, growing population, growing market, how long is it going to be before we start to see 
you know, real changes in these technologies. Well, so our, our simple headline says storage, uh, power storage is going to be bigger than solar. That, that the scale of the global market turns out to be much larger because storage is actually more useful than solar is. Uh, it just happens to be five to seven years behind in terms of the rate at which it's coming into the market. But any time you have a technology that comes down, again, on the order of 30% a year, what we have in the U.S. over the last year, we saw a 1,000% growth rate in, the, in energy storage devices in, um, connected into the grid. These things that's growing 1,000 percent a year turns out to be a pretty large market very, very quickly. And, and so what we're seeing is this convergence of technology innovation that really opens up new markets, and it allows us to operate existing systems in wholly different ways, again, opening up the market in ways that we didn't expect. Yeah, and if I can just maybe kind of scale part of that as well, because one of the uh, little bits of uh, sloppy thinking that sometimes goes on about the energy system is focusing purely on the power side. Uh, and uh, so indeed, you know, renewables are going to play a huge role in that. But even if you take the whole power sector globally and have it on wind and solar tomorrow, you've addressed 18% of the global energy system because you still need to have you know, thermal high temperature energy for your materials processes, for your uh, iron and steel manufacture, for your cement manufacture, for your materials manufacture. Uh, and so what we're talking about really here is the transformation of other sectors of the economy over time, either to be more electrified or to have other routes in which you can have a high thermal energy and capture carbon dioxide and store it. So innovation is needed in all these areas, and we have to think of it as innovation in each sector of the economy. And it's very, very different. There's a, a, a clear line on power generation. Uh, it's a harder uh, look at um, transportation. But if you begin to look at the heavy industries, then that becomes very, very difficult indeed. So you're going to see different sectors moving at different paces towards decarbonization. So not just different countries. And that's one of the reasons why you're going to need technologies like carbon dioxide capture and storage to mop up where there are already emissions, but also to create the opportunity combined with sustainable biomass generation to have net negative emissions in parts of the global economy. In order to motivate that, it comes back to that first discussion we had here earlier, you need to have some form of valuing reducing emissions. You need to have some kind of carbon pricing mechanism. Are we going to get that? We uh, can't seem to get well, it. Well, uh, we've been working with the Chinese State Council for the last three years, uh, and you see what's been happening in China. They have just announced moving from seven local schemes into a national scheme. So you're beginning to see this dynamic where that kind of development is happening. When you're sitting in your office game planning all this stuff, though, do you look at Washington, D.C., as we discussed before, and just roll your eyes and say, like, when are they going to get it together? Um, let me just say, my <laughs> wife is from the United States, uh, and I went to Caltech and MIT, so I love the United States. So We all do here. <laughs> I, I roll my eyes, yes, but with affection, but also a certain degree of frustration. Great. Uh, Everybody get your questions ready. We'll open it up for questions in a moment. First, I just want to ask one question for, for each of you or any of you. Uh, Bill Gates recently said he was going to invest $2 billion to develop breakthrough energy technologies, that we can't wait for the technologies that we're working on now to iterate. We need some kind of breakthrough. Is that a good use of his money? Is that a good thing to do with his $2 billion? Is that the, kind, is that the way we should be thinking about it? Or, you know, or would he be better off spending that money to drive policy changes or, or something else that would enable the, the market to just develop what we need? Doug, you look like you have something to say. Well, I, th I think, you know, it's kind of back to the innovation story. I, I, th I think that it's fantastic, particularly in this country, that people like Bill Gates or, or, or George Mitchell in the frack revolution decided they saw an opportunity and something important to them put their own money at work. And they did it with real passion and energy, and they hired the most uh, it's a little innovative. different, though. George Mitchell was an entrepreneur who was looking for, you know, to keep his supply going, and Bill Gates is an entrepreneur who has a lot of money to throw around now. And, th right? and that's a fantastic thing. Is I'm not, I'm not certain that you don't. 
when government tries to dictate outcomes, it's so hard to get that right. The unpredictability is, is so difficult. But by turning the, you know, the creative energies and capital at work is great, right? So if it doesn't work, the only, people, only person who loses money is Bill Gates. And if it does work, everyone wins. So finding ways to excite people about this. I mean, you know, I don't like low oil and gas prices. I know my shareholders don't like it. But I also know it's going to drive us, not only my company, but our industry, to be better at what, we're, what we do. And, and whether Bill Gates' experiment works or doesn't work, it's fantastic that he's willing to try. And trying to predict where that breakthrough will come from is virtually impossible. Right. But encouraging it to happen, I think, is exactly what government should do. And I, I do think, building on that, that you know, innovation and investing in innovation, as you were saying earlier, is crucial. But we need to also add to it that systems perspective that recognizes that there's dogs and tails. So people tend to focus on uh, an energy source, mm. not necessarily how you restructure parts of the economy. It makes a huge difference, for example, on uh, how you develop your urban settings on what your energy needs are. Uh, the United States, for personal transport, uses three times as much energy per person as the average European. Uh, and part of that is because you have big, heavy vehicles. But it's actually because you drive twice as far, and you drive twice as far because you have sprawling cities with limited public transport. These are all things that can be That's addressed. That's what made America great. It's what made America <laughs> use twice as much energy per person as anywhere else in the world. But, but that's one of the things I think that's in, uh, undergoing such rapid change. And I think this is where the innovation can be so powerful. When you combine the autonomous car idea, the idea of connected cars, the ability of cars to work, one of the things we hit is actually peak road. We don't, when, if cars can communicate with each other, we can actually get more greater density on the roads and therefore we don't need to actually uh, build as many roads. You get uh, the electrification activity uh, working in the automotive sector. All of these things begin compounding in a way that starts changing the, trans the transportation sector quite fundamentally. It costs 70 cents a mile right now, uh, all in for a car. We're headed towards a 15 cent a mile kind of world because of that rate of innovation. And so I think to your point, it's innovate, you know, if, if Gates is, is spending his money well, he's spending it not just on energy sources, but he's spending it on the, on the entire system and the infrastructure that's required to deliver that. I want to open it up and see if we have any questions here. Looking for hands. Here we have one right here. Let's wait for the mic and ID yourself, please. Good afternoon. Diane Regas from Environmental Defense Fund. Um, I want to ta ask a little bit about methane. Methane is the primary component of natural gas. About 20% of the climate change we'll experience in the next 20 years uh, comes from the emissions of methane. We've been working with Shell and six other oil and gas companies to develop a new detector that can cheaply find leaks so that you can go in and fix them fast. Question for you, Jeremy, you've been part of that, your company's been part of that project. What's one or two things we could do to get all the major oil and gas companies to start to detect methane leaks and go out and fix them fast? Well, I think that, um, you know, as you said, methane is, is an important topic. Uh, and I think there are, um, if you look at the, the whole kind of supply chain, I mean, clearly any leak of anything is a loss, an economic loss. So everybody's got an incentive. But there are, I think, a lot of good practices and a few bad actors in the whole. So I, I, I do think that you know, the development of things like um, effective uh, industry standards, even voluntary standards, will help improve that particular aspect of the, uh, the whole industry. You know, it's interesting to note that uh, we worked with EDF and some other companies in Colorado when they put some new rules together. But it's interesting, in the last 10 years, since 2005, natural gas production in the United States has gone up 26%, and methane emissions from natural gas production have gone down 38%. And that was a combination of voluntary industry action and largely local and state regulation. Um, and in fact, one of the things that, that really made a difference there was instead of so much regulation tells you how, and when you say how, you shut down the creative thinking and the innovation, and you actually believe yesterday's technology is the only technology that's available to you, where when you, you say what you want to achieve, 
you actually unlock all sorts of ideas that are unpredictable, whether it's a new detection device or it's a better and less expensive way to intervene. Um, you can do that. And, and of course, we all know that natural gas, um, the boom in natural gas in the United States not only has reduced energy cost in this country sub substantially, it's led to a large industrial revitalization that's occurred. Um, and on top of that, it's, it's changed our whole energy security mix uh, here as well. So the underpinning of this is important. And as we work to deal with some of, the, some of the concerns around it, and methane emissions is one, we have to make sure we get that balance right because sustainability comes down to this mix in energy of reliability, affordability, meeting society's environmental expectations. And we've got to get those balances right. I wanted to ask each of you, this panel is the future of energy. As we look into the future, I mean, when we look back in the recent past, the, the fracking revolution for most people came out of nowhere, changed the game, you know. Transformative technologies have a tendency to kind of come out of nowhere for most people. I'm curious for each of you, what's going to be, what's something, a surprising trend or breakthrough that we're going to see in the next five or ten years that's really going to be kind of a game changer that you see coming down the pike? Jeremy, maybe you want to start. Um, I think there will be a recognition of two things. Uh, one is that uh, electrification and deepening electrification is going to be an important part of transforming the consumption of energy over time. And secondly, there will be a recognition that hydrocarbons are going to continue to have an important role to play, even in a world which has achieved net zero emissions. Uh, one of the things that I'm kind of pleased that, that we're supporting, to, today's the launch of something called the Energy Transitions Commission, uh, and we have a few commissioners here, such as uh, Jules, who will be talking later, and I think Jean Pascal, and Chad, there's an opportunity to talk about that later. But it brings a kind of impartial focus on the transitions that are going to be required over the next decades to achieve those two great goals of spreading prosperity and addressing environmental stewardship. Matt, what do you, of all the technologies that you've been looking at, what's going to be exciting and sort of shocking to people or, or have a major impact in the future? Well, I, I do think that we, we talked earlier about electricity storage. I think that's actually going to be quite large and quite surprising and have uh, very significant implications on a, uh, on a global basis. I also think that the uh, combination of bringing software to the grid and to bring, bring solid state electronics to a set of things that Edison and Westinghouse first invented in 1885 uh, is actually going to be transformative to the efficiency of the grid overall. The, the amount of waste that we have in heat from the grid turns out to be a very large number uh, and our ability to manage that fundamentally differently a decade from now is going to be fascinating. Doug, what do you see? Well, you know, I, I think the one that we're probably going to look back on and see and realize it didn't happen as a big bang, but sort of happened day by day, it was sort of like the, the boiling frog story, yeah. but it is actually is all about information technology and information sharing and big data. I mean, uh, recently I was in one of our operations where our field operators are using iPads to control their operations, and it actually means their productivity is tripled. And it's actually made their job safer because they drive a third less miles and the single biggest risk they have in their job is an automobile accident. And when they arrive on location, they actually know the condition of the spot they're going to before they show up. And I think what's going to happen is the use of information and energy, whether it's in how the grid's managed or how we do our job uh, or how sectors we can't see. Uh, because even though w we use this a lot, I think this is just emerging and we're going to look up one day and realize whether it's emissions or efficiency, or whether it's being able to find opportunities that were too small to see before that now emerge, or that were too risky to pursue that now don't look as risky. Uh, I suspect that's the thing. Uh, my daughter, I'm, I'm third generation oil and gas guy, and my father worked in it, his dad, and my daughter works in it. I think this is maybe the thing that happens during her career. Well, I think we're gonna look up and see some exciting things have happened, but I just looked up and saw that our time is up. So please join me in thanking our panelists.